I want to take a quick moment before I go into my introduction um, to thank Professor Zimbaye, uh, Professor Reddy, Professor Moyo for their wonderful opening remarks. Um, I was very excited to be invited to this event. I'm even more excited hearing some of the important um, uh, topics that were mentioned um, in their opening remarks. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I am a postdoctoral research fellow um, and sociologist at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, so my areas um, of, of expertise um, in regard um, intersectionality, misinformation, uh, inequality uh, within the United States. Um, and I'm currently embarking on a, a research project that's very much in its infancy, um, but looking at the role of uh, political misinformation um, in regards to the uh, voting engagement of um, African-Americans um, and um, more specifically too, looking at the gender dynamics that are involved. Um, but for my talk today, um, I'm going to spend um, eight minutes, I'm trying my best here, and uh, talk about um, Black women um, and social justice in the era of misinformation and AI in South Africa and the United States. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, I should also mention too, I didn't specify that while I'm as being a postdoctoral research fellow at the Kennedy School, more specifically, I'm a part of the Technology and Social Change Project uh, where we focus on um, uh, primarily uh, disinformation and misinformation. Um, while it's more US focused, we do also take a global perspective as well. Uh, so just to quickly um, talk about some of the things I'll go over in this presentation. Um, I'm also briefly going to talk about um, the history of black women and social justice movements in South Africa and the US, uh, black women's social justice online engagement, some of the obstacles they encounter, and then um, the role of AI in this and future considerations. So black women have been and are the backbone of social justice movements in South Africa and the United States. And when I say backbone, what I'm referring to um, is organizing, protesting, and leading. Um, so obviously of the examples we can think of within South Africa um, includes the anti-passbook protests of 1956, um, but there are numerous other examples such as the defiance campaign, um, and within the United States, we also see um, a number of instances where Black women have been active um, in social justice movements, um, whether it's the fight for voting rights um, or uh, the gender equality movement. Despite being so crucial in these fights, they not only encountered racism, colonialism, sexism, poverty, and violence, but also a lack of recognition for their work, which I think is really important uh, to acknowledge. While we have Women's Day, which is extremely important and Women's Month, um, there still is a lot that we're uncovering about the history um, of um, Black women in the struggle for freedom within South Africa. Um, now, fast forward to the age of the internet. Um, the internet um, has fundamentally changed the organization, strategies, and potential of social justice movements. Uh, and the ways in which we see this is the impact of scale, for instance. Um, so how quickly, or rather, how easy it is for you to disseminate information to a large variety of people, and they're able to do so as well. Uh, the impact of speed, uh, how quick it is for you to put something up online and for other people, again, to like with a tweet, to retweet that and disseminate it to a wider audience. And then lower gatekeeping barriers to entry compared to traditional media. Um, you can put this uh, often, as long as you have access to the internet, you can put things out of the internet yourself. You don't need uh, to go through the traditional gatekeepers when we look at things like newspapers or even um, television networks. Um, so this has had, has had a fundamental uh, impact on how social justice has changed online. And we have definitely seen uh, black women um, in both countries take heed um, of this. So within South Africa, as far as Black women's digital activism, we see numerous examples. These are just a few of some of the things that we've seen, whether we're looking at Fees Must Fall, the total shutdown, or Inkosi Mama. Uh, within um, the United States, um, we also see a similar um, uh, move as well, whether we're looking at Me Too, um, Black Lives Matter, or Say Her Name. 
and I would have gone into more in, uh, details around some of those hashtags, but for sake of time, I'm going to move along. Um, there's quite a few obstacles to Black women's digital activism. Um, so some of these include massage noir, media manipulation, which includes disinformation and misinformation, online harassment, and access to the internet. Um, so whether we're looking at the cost of data um, and limits, infrastructure issues, and digital literacy. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm just gonna focus on massage noir and media manipulation. So the concept of massage noir, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, was coined by the um, black and queer academic Moya Bailey um, out of the United States. And she defines this as the specific hatred, dislike, distrust, and prejudice directed towards black women. And in regards to media manipulation um, at the research um, group that I'm a part of, we define this as the socio-technical process whereby motivated actors leverage specific conditions or features within an information ecosystem in an attempt to generate public attention and influence public discourse through deceptive, creative, or unfair means. And it's important to know this is different from media control, which is ex executed by governments or private sector actors through uh, government censorship, ISP level content blocking, content filtering, et cetera. And generally speaking, uh, there's two types of, of media manipulation, uh, disinformation and misinformation. And we've, these words have been floating around, um, but there is a distinct difference between the two. So when we talk about disinformation, we're referring to information that is deliberately false or misleading, often spread for political gain or profit or to discredit a targeted individual, group, movement, or political party. Whereas misinformation is information whose inaccuracy is unintentional and spread unknowingly. So there's a variety of methods that can be used to engage in uh, media manipulation. Um, so some of these include, but are not limited to memes, viral videos, forged documents or fake documents, recontextualized media. And we have an example of this right here. Um, so recontextualized media is any image, video, audio clip that has been taken out of its original context and reframed for an entirely different purpose or narrative frame. I'm um, in deep fix, uh, which is um, using machine learning to hybridize or generate human bodies and faces. Um, and just to um, clarify with this particular image um, from Dudu Zuma, uh, the ways in which this one was recontextualized is this was an image that she um, was saying was happening during the Zuma riots recently, when in fact, this image was from, a pro uh, from 2020 from a different protest. So um, for the sake of time, I'm actually going to just quickly jump through these next few slides. Um, but what I'm trying to point to with these slides is the, um, the merging together of this digital massage and war and media manipulation that we're seeing within the United States, uh, where Black women are disproportionately the subject of disinformation campaigns. Um, so one example I have here is the hashtag in Father's Day, and sorry, that's my timer, um, so I can make sure I don't go over. Um, the uh, in Father's Day disinformation campaign, which involved 4chan trolls who misrepresent themselves as Black female Twitter users in order to portray Black women as irrational, angry, and unintelligent. Um, and these are some images from um, one of these um, fake uh, Twitter, well, maybe fake isn't the right word, but uh, one of these um, 4chan trolls who misrepresent themselves as a Black woman, Nene Thompson, who's just not a real person. Um, in regards to this disinformation campaign. So skipping through slides really quickly for the sake of time, um, I wanted to talk about disinformation within South Africa. Um, gender dynamics regarding media manipulation um, are underexplored in South Africa as well as the United States. Um, however, um, issues that affect everyone in a society affect women as well, of course. Uh, especially when we think about the correlations between poverty, economic inequality, and gender-based violence. So for example, we know we have the Radical Economic Transformation Disinformation Campaign, uh, which according to the African Network for Centers of Investigative Reporting, uh, found that the RET network used white monopoly capital to distract from state capture, as well as attack critics of the Gupta family um, and Zuma. 
Um, COVID misinformation is another issue that we've seen with the Zuma riots as well. I showed an example already of media manipulation from Dudu Zuma. Um, another example was this image that was floating around, this uh, fake image of Zuma in prison, which is, um, as you can see here, something that was um, part of me media manipulation at that time. Um, the Put South Africans First disinformation campaign, um, and this is an example of a recontextualized image. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip quickly into talking about the role of AI in this. Um, AI can be used to create disseminate misinformation, whether we're talking about deep fakes, which we already touched upon, or bots. Um, but AI can also be used to fight misinformation. Um, algorithms can be used to detect and mitigate the spread of misinformation. Social media platforms, such as Facebook, currently use AI and humans for content moderation. By using articles that are labeled as inaccurate by users, with the ability of pattern recognition, AI can filter out or label future misinformation articles or posts. AI speed and scale is impossible for humans to replicate, which is one of the benefits of using this technology to manage misinformation and disinformation. Um, there's also an argument to be made that uh, human-led content moderation may also be psychologically traumatic. When you think about some of the language some of the imagery that's used, particularly when it comes to different marginalized populations, women, um, people of color, um, queer people, for instance, seeing this day in and day out can be traumatic. Uh, and as an example of um, the UN initiative, Global Pulse, that created um, a method to train AI to recognize fraudulent UN speeches um, as far as getting to deep fakes, so the ways in which we can use AI to combat this. Um, but while we, think about the benefits of using AI for this. It's also too important to be aware of some of the drawbacks. Um, the problem of the false positive um, is one that I'm referring to here, the blocking of accurate content. So for instance, in the United States, we've had quite a few Black Lives Matter um, activists who've argued that their content gets pulled down, um, but they've seen the content from white supremacists stay up. Uh, and often these platforms say that is a mistake. Um, so this is something that we need to also take into account. Um, and then lastly, as far as other considerations go, a one size fits all model of legislation or government uh, or corporate policies will be insufficient with dealing with uh, misinformation and disinformation. The internet is not separate from the real world. Just as we create laws and regulations for people who threaten people in person or falsely accuse people of a crime, we should have similar rules regarding um, online misinformation. Um, South Africa's cyber crimes bill is an excellent example of legislation to combat disinfo, but more is still needed. And transparency um, is also key. Um, regarding platforms, regulations should be clear and there should be a method to challenge the flagging and removal of content. Um, educating the media, sorry, the public on media literacy, um, whether these campaigns are led by the government or telecom companies or public services. And then lastly, diversifying AI programmers and designers. Diversity of thought and experience is a strength. Um, it starts in primary school um, on through uh, the educational journey and the importance of inclusive workplace um, culture to reinforce this. Thank you. Thank you so much.